Hello, we're here to record uh, a brief interview with two of the key officials in the finance ministry of Hungary. Um, this is a part of a, a rich and wide program of analysis and investor relations work that OMFIF is doing during the course of 2023 with the finance ministry and also with the central bank and also with the AKK, the debt agency. And we'll talk a little bit about the debt agency too during this conversation. But I'd like to introduce uh, on the left of the screen, I think you'll see it on the left as I see it. Um, we have Peter Banai, who is the state secretary within the ministry responsible for the state's budget. Uh, he is a 25 year veteran of the finance ministry. So there isn't much he doesn't know about what goes on there. And on your right, for the avoidance of any doubt, the man with the splendid beard, uh, is Tibor Tot, who is also a state secretary within the Ministry of Finance. Uh, you've been there about a year and a half now, I think, Tibor. Uh, and Tibor's responsibility is for international affairs and indeed the debt management of the sovereign uh, Republic of Hungary. So I'm going to go straight into a, to a, a perhaps slightly open-ended question, but just, just to get us started. Um, Pre-pandemic, Hungary went through a very noticeable and, and report, widely reported on uh, golden period of GDP growth. Uh, the problem during the, uh, the years immediately prior to pandemic was a lack of labour for all of the new jobs that were, that were being created. Um, I'd like to ask you both, what steps are needed now? What are you doing now um, to return to a stable and sustainable growth rate of, say, 4%. Yes, Christopher, thank you. Uh, basically, yes, we can call a very successful period in the economic history of Hungary, the pre-pandemic, let's say, eight to nine years, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, basically uh, it's very strong growth potential throughout those years, but this uh, strong growth performance was not achieved easily because the labor market at the beginning at two, uh, 2010, when this government took over, was in a totally different shape. At that time, uh, that uh, the unemployment rate was extremely high. And uh, the total level of employment only reached 3.7 million. This has been changed during that period in a way that by now uh, the total number of employed people is edging towards the 4.8 million, which means that during this period, more than 1 million people have been attracted into the labor market. And before the pandemic period, the, the average GDP growth of the country reached or exceeded the 4%, which was a steady, steady growth level and, uh, and the sustainable uh, growth level, which was basically, but luckily only temporarily stopped uh, by the pandemic period. It, it is important to highlight that after the pandemic, uh, the recovery of the Hungarian economy was one of the fastest uh, within the European Union. So in 2021, uh, the GDP growth exceeded 7%. And even last year, it, uh, it was very close to 5%. Both years, uh, these growth level were much higher than the European Union's average level. This year, uh, it's a challenging year for us from a growth perspective because of the high inflation throughout Europe, uh, but especially in Hungary, it's a great challenge for us, which is negatively affecting uh, the growth potential of the country. So what we have experienced is that the, the, in the last quarters, uh, there is a technical recession in the country. But as we are uh, successfully uh, fighting against the inflation, uh, we are absolutely optimistic that this growth potential and the intensive growth period will come back. And as from next year, we are also again be on the 4% growth level. 
Um, this is uh, this uh, performance is boosted by the, as you mentioned, the very tight labor market. Uh, the unemployment rate is around 3.9%. Uh, the labor market is basically a demanding one, so still searching new potential labor force uh, on the market. It's also boosted by the very high investment level, which is approximately 28% of the GDP. This is one of the highest within the European Union. It's also uh, boosted by the very strong export performance, and on top of this, uh, we have achieved the uh, record figures in terms of FDI last year, which was mm. 6.5 billion euros. Well, the, you mentioned inflation, of course, and, and the Hungary has suffered particularly, as you highlighted. Um, another part of this series is, is an interview with the central bank, uh, which will be going live at the same time when that topic is discussed in detail. But they still seem to be at a headline uh, figure determined to get into single figures by the end of the year. But you, you touched on this FDI uh, point and record FDI last year, as you said. I'd, I'd like to kind of delve a little bit underneath that and also in the post-pandemic recovery generally. What sectors have driven that? And, and most particularly, is, is there any kind of difference in the makeup of economic activity post-pandemic and, and as you see it going forward, driven by FDI and, and, and consumption and all the other factors, is there anything shifting in terms of how that's made up? And the good news in terms of the recovery and the, and the quite impressive rebound in the economic growth, I think, is that uh, it is mainly supported by all industries. So I, I maybe I can pick one or two leading ones but uh, if we see uh, the details of, of the of the increase we can see that all, almost all of the industries are supporting and uh, and then helping uh, this gross performance but if i would like to highlight only one i should definitely mention the automotive industry uh, which is uh, one of the flagship uh, industries within the country as the biggest German car manufacturers are here in the country with huge uh, production facilities and they have all decided to switch uh, the production to the electric uh, car manufacturing uh, production for the future and this is also intensifying additional investments from the supply chain. Uh, most notably is the uh, electric battery uh, in related investments and uh, mainly the Korean and Chinese investors are announced very significant new developments and investments in the country, which are uh, strongly linked to build the new supply chain with these manufacturing capabilities. Uh, so this provides a very good background for the country that, uh, as I mentioned, that the last year's figure of uh, 6.5 million euro FDI, in this year, uh, it is even could be doubled and it is going to exceed the 12 billion. Even the last year figure was a historic record that uh, I wouldn't have to mention that this year's performance is really outstanding and it's, it's a record figure again. So uh, we are optimistic that based on these new investments, which are uh, uh, because of the fiscal tightening is not coming from the state uh, this year, but it's coming from, from the corporate sector, local and also from foreign uh, investors. This is going to give the strength and power to the economy, which will result in a 4% growth for next year. But, well, with all of this new activity and FDI driven activity and so on, come back to we both mentioned the, the, the labor market question. Um, Peter, I don't know if you have a thought on this. Are, is there a need for some kind of more dramatic labor market reform in order to be able to execute on all of this promised economic activity? Do you, do you see that as a, a continuing issue that? policy needs to address? And if so, how? 
actually, I think that uh, the major labor market reforms were done by the government at the beginning of the last decade. As mm. mentioned by Tibor previously, uh, unemployment ratio was significantly high. It was above 11% after the crisis of 2008-2009. The um, activity ratio was among one of the 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 the, the worst. It it was it was the worst uh, uh, in the European Union together with the Maltese uh, uh, numbers. So we made several reforms in order to uh, give incentives uh, to people to be active and to step out from, from the uh, um, activity uh, uh, programs. On the same, on the other hand, we have made quite serious tax cuts as regards taxes linked to employment. So both programs, uh, which 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 so to say pushed people from being uh, uh, inactive to activity, like uh, cutting back early retirement schemes, uh, scrutinizing uh, disability uh, pension schemes. This pushed people from inactivity to being uh, active. And on the other hand, we made uh, quite serious tax cuts if uh, companies employed people who previously were uh, unemployed. Okay. The factor of these uh, tax reforms, other legislative reform reforms, and uh, as a result of the uh, quite significant GDP growth uh, mentioned by Tibor, let me mention here that uh, between 2014 and 2019, the Hungarian growth ratio was uh, at 4.1%. This was the average growth ratio, while the EU average was 2.1%. Uh, so we had almost a double uh, growth ratio. So as a result of this, uh, employment could increase by the nation 1 million people. Uh, we, could, we could keep this high employment level during the pandemic, and we could keep this high uh, employment level during the last year after the war uh, started in, uh, in Ukraine. So mm. from my perspective, I think uh, uh, we have a system which provides the high level employment in the coming years. The question is whether the new uh, investments will be operational given the tight character of the labor market. Mm. So now the key question I think is to increase productivity. And uh, that's why national and EU related budgetary resources are used more and more to increase productivity uh, uh, in the, in the uh, you know, corporate sector in order to be able uh, to increase the growth by the mentioned uh, four uh, percent uh, average in the coming years. That's why that's what we we are calculating with the growth ratio at around four percent. And uh, as mentioned previously, uh, we need to increase productivity, and we have some sources to increase productivity. And, and obviously, as the man in charge of the budget, you have a keen eye on the fiscus, um, but you're able to execute tax cuts because you have hundreds of thousands more people employed and therefore paying taxes is it as is the equation as simple as that sometimes yes for example for example between 2017 and 2021 22 the so called social com uh, social security contribution paid by the uh, employers decreased from 20 seven percent to 13 percent so we made quite significant tax cuts uh, parallel with the mentioned uh, uh, focused or or, or, or targeted uh, tax advantages on, on labor market and as a result of these uh, uh, tax cuts still we could keep the budgetary balance below the maastricht c percent uh, limitation yeah. I mean, because, of course, normally when governments want to discourage a behaviour, they tax it. Um, so taxing employment 
probably tends to discourage employment. So that's a, a, a step very much in the right direction, I, I have to say. Let's talk a little bit about, about how the government actually finances itself in, in terms of sovereign borrowing. Um, the, the AKK, the agency which is in charge of that, um, is a well-known and welcome participant in the global capital markets. And of course, as we've been hearing recently, a topic much in the news, uh, very, very active in, in raising um, funding from local retail savers through the domestic retail bond market. I just wanted to ask you, perhaps Tibor, back to you. Um, do you expect to see any any kind of different sorts of activity from the AKK? Are they going to be looking at tapping new markets? How are they trying to broaden their investor base? Some new kinds of structures, thematic bonds of different sorts. Just give us a preview of what you think is coming there. Yes, absolutely. Actually, I think uh, it is important to highlight that uh, one of the there are two cornerstones of, of the financing uh, from the debt management uh, debt management agency point of view. One is that uh, this government has learned the lesson lesson from the two thousand and eight crisis. And that within the total debt of the country has to be reduced uh, significantly in order to uh, have a much reliable financing structure. This government has, uh, has achieved that, that within the total range, uh, only approximately 25, 26 of the total debt is foreign currency related debt. The rest is Hungarian foreign uh, exposure. And within the Hungarian foreign exposure, it is very important to highlight that uh, it's on an annual basis, it's growing uh, the share which is, really, which is uh, exposed uh, to the Hungarian households. This is very important, not only because this is eliminating uh, exchange rate risk, but more importantly, because the paid interest rate Especially, uh, this is important in a period like this, uh, when the inflation is high and the interest rates are growing, then these interest rates on savings are uh, basically paid and provided to the Hungarian households. Uh, so this is one key element of the financing structure. The other one is that uh, we would like to uh, build on a diverse, diversified investor base and we are very much focused on uh, the green financing because uh, we believe that this is uh, the future of the financing. And uh, AKK is a really a pioneer in this respect. I would say not only in, in, in Central Europe, but in uh, uh, all over Europe. And we have tapped uh, uh, markets, uh, not only the traditional markets like the euro market and the US dollar market, but we have very successful bond issuances uh, in China and in Japan. And also it is important, we have not only had successful bond issuance, but we had a successful green bond issuances on this market. So what we are intending to do in the future is to continue this strategy also trying to tap uh, some other new investor uh, base uh, if it is possible. But uh, it is important to highlight that uh, the debt uh, maturity profile of the country is so, uh, so uh, relaxed uh, that uh, we are in a very comfortable position when we are coming again to the market with a new uh, foreign currency bond issuance. So we are rather focusing in the upcoming year with diversification and ESG issues and, uh, and green bond issuances mm. uh, in other markets. Of course, the Hungarian consumer had a terrible time a decade or more ago with all of those Swiss franc mortgages and, and euro mortgages and so on, which in a, a lesson, if ever a lesson were, <laughs> were needed, uh, borrowing, borrowing in a different currency from the one you earn. It, that, that's the lesson is right there. Um, Peter, let me just ask you, the, the role of any finance ministry in any country uh, is essentially to kind of 
pull back on the ambition, spending ambitions of line ministries. Um, and, and every finance ministry has, has to do that. But do you face any particular challenges in that respect? Where do the where are the sort of push and pull factors in terms of allocating state budget? Yes, uh, let me start from a different angle. Let me start answering this question from a from different angle. And let me mention that we have a constitution, the Hungarian base law, which says that all time governments have to prepare and implement a budget which results in debt reduction. We have this quite strict rule from 2011. And we have a so-called fiscal council, which um, checks whether this uh, criteria is fulfilled or not. Even the Hungarian parliament cannot vote on the next year's budgetary proposal if the green line, the agreement, is not given by the fiscal council. The fiscal council is independent uh, uh, body from the government. Again, and uh, this is an organ. This is this is a body. This is a special institution, so to say who scrutinizes not just budgetary proposals, but also scrutinizes the implementation of the budget. This legal background is well known by, by all the uh, line ministries, and uh, they know that they have to respect the budgetary ceilings approved by the parliament. At the same time, of course, it's not just the fiscal council, but it's the Ministry of Finance who scrutinizes implementation of the budget by budgetary chapters by the so-called ministries. For example, in Hungary, all line ministries have to send a prognosis on the annual use of the uh, budgetary appropriation. They have to send a prognosis on uh, their expenditures to the Ministry of Finance uh, six times uh, a year. And in the second half of the year, they have to send this prognosis, knowing the fact that if the final out outcome, outturn will be significantly different from their prognosis, then they have to uh, 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 pay a special amount to the central budget. So uh, uh, if the prognosis is wrong, then it has uh, consequences. So they, they, get, they, get, they get fined for not doing their homework well. They get fined. So we have, we have not only uh, the budget approved by the parliament. We have not only the fiscal uh, uh, council, but we have an internal procedure on how to control spending of the uh, uh, line ministries. Mm -hmm. And of course, if there's a, 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 an economic problem in the world, uh, like we have the pandemic, uh, we have the war uh, as a result of which uh, there's a there's a cool down in, in in all Europe. Then we have to revise the prognosis. But still, we know that uh, in Hungary we have to keep the debt to GDP ratio on a declining path. And the only escape holes from this uh, uh, debt decreasing uh, path is linked to GDP contraction. If the real GDP is in positive term, then we have to keep uh, uh, the debt on the, on the declining path. This is a very important uh, legal rule, which uh, gives the answer how we could reduce the Hungarian debt to GDP from above 80% uh, in 2010-2011 uh, to 653 before the pandemic. Of course, as a result of pandemic, that to GDP jumped up uh, to around 80%, but now again, it's on a declining path. We calculate uh, that uh, uh, by the end of the year, that to GDP can be at around 70% of GDP. Mm -hmm. So it can be at, uh, at around 70%. 70%. Well, thank, thank, thank you both very much. I, I'm conscious of the fact that people watching this in uh, the weeks and months to come will say, well, why isn't he asking about the EU funds, the cohesion funds and this kind of thing, which of course at the time we're recording this uh, interview has, has been in the news in the last couple of days. Um, there is of course a new ministry for EU affairs, which has been set up quite recently, um, but clearly EU cohesion funds, other, other funds from the European Commission um, have an impact on the, uh, on the fiscus. 
Where, I mean, can you say anything about that at this moment or is it too much in a state of flux? What's your, what's your thinking, Tibor, on, on the direction of travel in this? Actually, I believe we are on the good track. Uh, there is no official announcement yet, but we are absolutely optimistic. Uh, last year, uh, when I met with investors, there were, at that time, there were concerns uh, whether the Hungarian government will be able to reach cons consensus with the European Commission and can we reach an agreement on the EU funds. At that time, we were absolutely optimistic as well that at the end of the day, we are going to reach that agreement. And that has happened. And the last December, we could conclude an agreement not only on the recovery and resilience uh, program, but also we have signed the partnership agreement. And the signing of these two agreements basically secured the total funds for the country, which is available. And so now we are in the process of negotiating the, the disbursement. So when we are coming, these funds, which are secured uh, by these contracts, Originally, we were a bit more optimistic in terms of uh, the disbursement dates, dates, and this optimism is deriving from our commitment that we are doing everything what the European Commission is asking from, from us. So we have, uh, we have had to uh, comply with the requirements, not only uh, the, the uh, horizontal uh, conditionality requirements, which are mainly related to the rule of law issues, but also uh, related to the 27 so-called super milestones that we have to fulfill. First of all, we were focusing on to solve uh, the issue, which is called the rule of law related uh, problems. And the spring uh, was managed uh, throughout together with the commission to find out and identify those concerns that the commissions are having and what could be the potential uh, solution and treatment for those concerns. Uh, by the end of spring, by, by the end of May, we could agree, identify and find those measures and new potential uh, laws and bills that have to be passed in order to uh, comply with these requirements that has, uh, has happened. So the parliament have, uh, has approved all of these legislation which came uh, into force uh, at the beginning of June and uh, we have we have had one additional requirement which is a so-called self-assessment which we also have submitted to the commission uh, on the 17th of July so at now so now we are just waiting the final evaluation of the commission okay. we are in this final process we are absolutely optimistic that as, as the end of this process, uh, they are going to give the green light, first uh, clarifying and, uh, and uh, green lighting the rule of law issues, which figure that is going to be released is, is quite close to the figure that has been recently published. And of course, we are on the same track with, uh, with regards to the remaining the so-called super milestones. We are also in the final stage and our determination to fulfill all of the requirements of the commission is, is, is there. So based on our assumptions by the end of this year, uh, a significant breakthrough will be achieved. Good, thank you. And just final technical question in a way, really, Peter, How, when, you're, when you're designing the budget and planning the budget, obviously you have quite a big variable in terms of the things we've just been talking about. Uh, you know, one here's the 13 billion euros as a number and 22 billion euros, including different elements of the, of the funding. But do you plan your budget assuming none of that, all of it, or some of it? Yes. Sir. That's quite a difficult question to end on, but have a go. Oh, so a very good question. A question, a question uh... Uh, which was uh, discussed by the parliament as well. And I mentioned the parliament because we have an approved budget for next year. And in this budget, we have calculated with the disbursement of all uh, EU subsidies, which are uh, 
which were which were approved once by the European Council and the European Parliament as well. So uh, we have one option. The one option is agreement with the European institutions. And if we uh, we, we can conclude with this uh, uh, open uh, questions, I hope that uh, we will be able to disperse uh, actually this uh, the, these EU, uh, EU subsidies. Let me mention here that the, the 2024 budget, we have taken into account uh, all uh, EU subsidies, not just those ones uh, uh, where we have no debate, no problem at all uh, with the European uh, uh, Commission. Uh, as regards agricultural subsidies, rural development subsidies, uh, structural funds and cohesion fund linked to the previous uh, financial perspective. These are, of course, uh, sources uh, where transfers from the European Commission have no problem. So transfer is uh, uh, continuous. And we have taken into account the actual use absorption of those funds as well, where uh, some questions are, uh, are still open. Let me mention that um, in this year, approximately two thirds of the total uh, EU subsidies are linked linked to programs where we have uh, no open issues. Only one third of the uh, total uh, EU subsidies are within the discussed uh, uh, program category. For next year, the bulk of the money is linked to the still uh, discussed uh, uh, programs like the Recovery and Resilience Fund that as, as mentioned by Tibor, uh, we think that all open questions will be closed and there will be no actual uh, problem with the transfer of these sources from the European Union's budget. Well, that's excellent news and, and a, a very good a very good place to to draw a halt to our conversation, very interesting conversation. Peter Tewod, thank you very much indeed for joining us and for talking to us about these questions. And anybody who is watching this, um, please do have a look elsewhere on the website. There's a special Hungary channel, which tells you all about the activities that we are engaged in uh, during the rest of, during the balance of this year. Uh, we will finish by publishing an analytical report summing up all of our findings towards the end of the year. But before that, please do join us in Budapest on the 16th of November for our OMFIF Budapest Forum, where you can meet these gentlemen and many others in person. So please do come along, have a look at our website and register your interest. It doesn't even cost you anything. We don't pay your airfare, but you don't have to buy a ticket. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed in Budapest to Thank be you, continued. Looking forward to see you here. Thank you.